Hey guys, welcome to episode four for Medic Junkies. Today we're going to talk about Central Arizona Regional EMS Guidelines again. Um, just to forewarn you, this is going to be a full review comparison from the 2019 West Valley Protocols uh, in comparison to now our new protocols. Okay, So where this kind of originated from was for my department, our EMS committee, we some of our members started hearing some rumors from other members and other departments that we were switching to new protocols. Um, and at the time we had no idea about this. So we decided to look into it and sure enough, we are going to these protocols. So um, we kind of got together and we figured out, okay, how are we gonna roll this out? How are we gonna do the training? And the more that we dug into these protocols, the more we realized that they are very different compared to those 2019 West Valley protocols, okay? Um, pretty much every single guideline has changed, whether it's a new drug, a um, something's been added, something's taken out, there's a new dose, um, or at very least, just the format is extremely different, okay? So part of the training that we've been doing, um, especially the hands-on stuff, has been just simply learning how to navigate through the application and through these protocols, okay? Um, so just to start off with a couple things real quick, um, I think you need to get the application on your phone. Whether you have an Android or an iOS iPhone, um, we have our department made some booklets which are super cool, but I can see them very quickly becoming outdated. Uh, one of the ideas of all these agencies coming together, um, all of the doctors and making one uh, central Arizona protocol they put it online and made an app for it um, so that they can update it pretty quickly and regularly. Now the creators of this app are the same people that made the PPP app, Paramedic Protocol Provider. Um, I know that's been a pretty common one out there. I've used that for a few years now. It's been awesome. Um, so the layout of the app will be fairly similar um, to that one. Now real quick, if you are an Android user, you guys are in luck. It's the easiest process for you to get this app. Simply go to your app store type in Central Arizona Regional EMS Guidelines and it should pop up right away. Um, and you can see right here is a couple screenshots. Um, I don't have an Android, but some people sent me uh, some screenshots of what their phones look like. Okay, so click on that, it should load right away. Now for the Apple users, all right, um, if you follow this link right here, the iOS uh, website, it will give you a code. Now some people have tried to open that link on their phone or iPads and it gives you like some type of error screen. It doesn't work. So I found that you need to click on that link or type it in on a computer and then it pops up with this screen and it gives you a code. And every time I've done it, it's a different code. Um, so it's not necessarily like this code is not really the one you have to use. Just whatever pops up. Although that one might work for you. All right, so for the iPhone users, what I would recommend is even if you have the old PPP app, uh, you can try to upload these protocols, but it'll direct you right to the Apple Store to download any a new protocol app anyway. Um, so I just go to your Apple Store, type in PPP space agency, okay, and you'll see on the right-hand side there, that's the one you want to click on, download it, and then open it up, all right? It's going to ask you a series of questions or a bunch of different process here to download. It'll ask you add protocol, hit yes, then it'll pop up with um, all the different states that are within these protocols or within this app. So of course, scroll down to Arizona, you're gonna look for Central Arizona Regional EMS, click on that one. It'll give you the terms of service, just hit I agree. It'll say add protocol, of course download. Go to the app store, okay. And then of course you're gonna have to sign in, so hopefully you know your code. Now, this is the part where I've noticed helping a bunch of people do it. It may or may not want you to actually type in that code that we got. Um, so it'll ask to re redeem code. Um, if it wants you to redeem a code, then punch in that code and it sh should work just fine. But a lot of people give your phone a second because it takes a second for it to think and process. And you might see that little wheel spinning. Um, and all of a sudden it just boom, pops up with this screen that says done. Okay, so it will actually download it for you without redeeming that code, um, maybe. So when this pops up, hit done. And then what you need to do is go back to your home screen on your phone, scroll, because I don't know which page it's gonna end up on, but you'll see here in the top left corner that it's gonna look like the Arizona State. Okay, and of course it says care MSG there. 
So we're gonna use those for our protocols. Now, one of the reasons why my agency waited a little while to bring these out was because we were hoping they were gonna update some of the treat and refer protocols, which we are doing. Um, at this time, there are no treat and refer guidelines in the new ones. So we were directed to use the 2019 West Valley protocols for treat and refer. Other than that, we're gonna go back to these new protocols, okay? Um, we're hoping that this app will be added to all of our iPads, um, that way it's on there. However, again, I still recommend that you put it on your phones. Uh, one problem I could see right now as we're in the super hot summer months is that, um, you know, five minutes out in the sun on a 962, your iPad's gonna overheat and then you can't use it. So hopefully somebody's got the phone they can knock out here. Um, once we get into the app, this is gonna be like your home screen. You can click on all these little buttons here and it brings you to multiple other protocols. What I found using the booklet, or if you use the PDF version that we're gonna go through, there is no front index. So if you're trying to find bronchospasms or cardiac arrest or what's the dose for Lido for an easy IO, it is so freaking hard to navigate the papers because you can't find what you need. You'd have to make your own tabs on there. So again, the app, I, I really think you need to get the app because it's gonna be so much easier. Now, navigating even these buttons are gonna be pretty difficult. So I dare you. Think of some random things that you'd maybe want to pull up on a call, in the middle of a call, and try to find it, okay? If it's not working out real quick for you, I would highly recommend use that search bar option. You can punch in a drug, you can punch in like bronchospasm, cardiac arrest, um, hyperkalemia, shock, whatever you need, and boom, it should pop up a list of those protocols. Now, there was an update last week, I believe, or the, just you know the week before, and what the update did was that if you scroll down on that home page on the very bottom option should say drug profiles that button is awesome so let's say we have somebody who's an asthmatic and i know eventually i'm gonna, I'm gonna have to start a mag drip okay but oh man what's the dose of mag well click on drug profiles scroll down to mag sulfate click on that and then on that page on the very bottom will give you every protocol that involves mag so whether it's your preeclamptic eclamptic uh, bronchospasms, you know, you name it, you can click on that, boom, goes right to that protocol. Now, also within the protocols, you'll see all of the medications are going to be in blue. Those are also linked. So you can click on, say, epinephrine in your code uh, protocol, and it'll take you right to the drug profile. So you can go back and forth either way. Um, so I think it's pretty good. Uh, you just really need to get familiar with it, right? Because these are going to be different than what we're used to, okay? So there's the app, go get the app, and then come on back. Um, now, a couple other things I wanna touch on. Oh, real quick, just to let you know, there's gonna be multiple parts to this. Uh, overall, with my crews, this training's taken usually about an hour and a half to two hours to review the PDF, um, but there was always some interaction with the crews. So I'm hoping I can knock everything out in about an hour, hour and a half tops, um, but because I don't wanna bore everybody to sleep, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and make several parts to it, break it up a little bit. Uh, also, I'm assuming that, you know, people watching this are experienced providers. They know pretty much what they're supposed to do or what medications to give in certain scenarios. So I'm not going to bore you by going through every line item of every protocol. I'm assuming, um, giving you the benefit of the doubt, that you are fully aware of what your protocols were last year. So I'm just gonna to touch on the updates. Everything's gonna be highlighted, things that our committee together has found are, again, either different, added, deleted, um, something, okay? So while we were reviewing these, uh, a lot of questions came up in our minds and we felt like we needed some clarification from our medical director before we rolled the training out, okay? So we compiled a list of questions, we emailed our medical director, and these were some of them that came up. Now through training, we have more questions and I'm sure I'll post an update on those once we get some answers back. But for right now, as we review the protocols, it's gonna say per local protocols on there. Um, every agency is gonna be a little bit different. I don't know what kind of special protocols you may have. For my agency, uh, there's only one special protocol that we have, which is for a very unusual child with a rare seizure disorder. So we have um, let's just say Jane Doe's protocol, okay? Um, HIPAA, trying not to say her name. 
Um, so that's the only one that we're going to follow for us. Now, um, let's see, online medical direction for each of these situations. Um, as always, if you know there's something within your scope of practice that you can do, like a certain drug, you know the dosing, you know how it works, you know it's going to be beneficial to your patient, um, just because it's not written in the protocols doesn't mean you can't do it. You just need to get on the phone first and call the doctor and make sure he's on board with you. Okay. Uh, under the pain management protocol, uh, morphine is no longer recommended to go IM. And in fact, a lot of the IM drugs that we're used to have either been taken out or have switched to intranasal routes. Okay. Uh, reason why in pain morphine was taken out, we do have fentanyl. Fentanyl would be preferred. Um, apparently morphine has an unpredictable absorption rate going intramuscular. So use your intranasal fentanyl if you cannot get um, an IV. Uh, this next one, morphine is acceptable for peds at 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. Um, when we get into that protocol, I'll show you the format of how we decipher between adult protocols, pediatric protocols, or some that it's the same protocol regardless. Okay. Now, under the seizure protocol, um, I was always taught and I'm always used to with eclamptic patients, treat the seizure first and then follow up with your mag drips. Um, however, I just wanted to be clear and reiterate to those that I have taught in the past that uh, actually we need to be treating with our mag first and then if they're not responsive to that then of course go back to your benzos for your seizure management. With anaphylaxis, here's a, a real different one. If a patient has a prescribed um, epi auto injector, okay, they want us to actually grab the patient's epi pen and stab them IM with it. Okay. Uh, they don't want us wasting a lot of time trying to draw up our own medication just to give them the same med at the same dose, right? Um, so just use theirs. It's more of a speed issue. Now with all intramuscular uh, um, IM drugs, they are recommending and they prefer that we go anterior lateral, so mid lateral thigh. We shouldn't really be, really, we shouldn't really be going on the deltoid or the butt. Go mid lateral thigh, okay? For the cardiac arrest, now pay attention to your protocols, there's two different for ages. There's the eight and older cardiac arrest and there's under eight cardiac arrest, okay? Regardless of major change is how many doses of epi we can give. We're so used to giving just epi on epi on epi on epi during our whole transport, okay? Um, studies have shown that they've actually looked at ROSC patients about 30 days after their cardiac arrest event. Okay, so patients get ROSC, 30 days later they evaluate and they found that those patients have a high chance of neurological deficits. Um, so we know by giving epinephrine and a code we're trying to get that vasoconstriction to increase blood pressure to the brain. However, when we jack them up with so much epi, we actually cause so much constriction that now we've decreased the perfusion to the brain. So again, now they're having anoxic type injuries. So three rounds of epi in a code and you're done. That's it. Okay. Uh, under the CCR protocols, it still says to do four rounds of compressions. But within those four rounds of compressions, we're going to give three epis still. Only three epis for cardiac arrests. Okay. Now, in the 2019 protocols, uh, if we had to use CPAP, it recommended that we could use some type of medication for uh, extremely anxious patients, patients that weren't really tolerating that mask, okay? So in 2019, they recommended morphine, fentanyl, Valium, Ativan. Um, however, in the new protocols, there is zero recommendation for medications. We were told that they'll probably update that next year with something. But as of right now, there's nothing. So if a patient's not tolerating your mask, guess what? You're going to have to call the doctor and get orders for it. Okay. Under the bronchospasm protocols, um, they recommend using dexamethasone. Um, however, we, my agency, is not going to be carrying dexamethasone. We still have solumedrol. So basically, in lieu of dexamethasone, we'll use the methylprednisolone. In a lot of those respiratory protocols, they're utilizing nebulized epinephrine a lot more now. Um, basically, 
a question here for pediatric patients with Strider. Uh, dexamethasone required to properly treat patients or is nebulized epinephrine sufficient treatment? Doctor said use dexamethasone if available. We don't have that. Um, epi can be used with or without dexamethasone. All right, for RSI, my agency is still not doing RSI. I wish we would, but I don't think we're ever going to get it. Um, so what we used to be able to do was follow the protocol sedation for innovation. There is not a protocol for that anymore. So um, if for whatever reason you feel you need to use medications to drop a patient to get an airway, maybe a severe anaphylactic patient, a burn patient, some kind of head trauma patient that's still awake or combative, um, we may still need to use some medications to put them down. Uh, I would highly recommend go to the RSI protocol and I would ask, of course you got to call the doctor now, ask for the drugs that are within that protocol like your Versed, fentanyl, ketamine, those options. Okay, um, The doses that are recommended in RSI, those are pretty good doses so I would just go with those. Um, I highly recommend using ketamine if you're going to put somebody down um, and then when it talks about continued sedation if you stuck, if you went with ketamine, you might as well stick with ketamine and keep doing it. Okay, um, really, there's only one reason why I would think Versed would be a better option than ketamine. Um, one, they say if if there's a known cardiac history, okay, um, we don't want to use ketamine. But typically, when you have that head trauma patient who's extremely hypertensive, combative, possibly seizing. Uh, that patient would probably be better off with Versed. We know Versed is probably going to drop the pressure or can drop the pressure, um, and that might actually be a good thing for the brain. We don't want to have big drops, just but little drops might be beneficial. Okay, and of course the Versed is going to help with the seizure where the ketamine will not. Okay, now keep in mind, ketamine is a sedative, and it's really good for analgesia, whereas Versed is only a sedative. So if you go with Versed, don't forget to use some fentanyl with that protocol also, okay? All right, do not resuscitate. Some big changes here. It used to be, if let's say we show up, grandpa's a code, grandma's saying, hey, I have a DNR, but I can't find it, okay? What'd you do? Well, we used to tell the, somebody on the crew, hey, do two minutes of compressions, the rest of us, we're going to try to scramble and help grandma find this protocol. Um, and if we can't find it within two minutes, we'll come back and we'll do our normal resuscitative efforts. Okay. Well, now um, their doctor saying, do not touch the patient for two minutes. Just leave them be. Everybody helps try to find the, um, the DNR and then we'll come back and treat the patient if we can't find it. Okay. Now, an additional change, if they don't have a DNR, but somebody comes up and says that they have power of attorney, okay? We can actually follow the orders of that person that has power of attorney. So maybe grandma says, hey, I got power of attorney. I don't want you to touch him. He, he never wanted that. We got to follow that, okay? But they must also provide documentation just like a DNR, okay? It's got to be a valid document. And I'm going to pull up a DNR and some of these power of attorneys just so we really know and understand what they look like, okay? Um, so we'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, under the neonatal patients uh, or neonatal resuscitation, it does mention using some CPAP there. We don't have the equipment for pediatric CPAP. So if you feel that they're not ventilating properly, we're going to use positive pressure ventilation with the BVM. Okay? Uh, with our pressors, dopamine and epi infusions are out, gone. Okay. Uh, in fact, we are going to be pulling dopamine out of our boxes once we go live with these, um, and we're expected to go live July 1st, okay? So if you have a patient who is hypotensive, if they are shocky, um, anything, for any reason, their pressures are in the toilet, uh, the only presser we have now are push-dose epi, okay, which I've used many times before. They're very effective, okay? I wish we still had some infusion capabilities, but... Uh, push dose epi will probably do us just fine to keep somebody alive from point A to point B. Okay. All right, let's pull up some of these uh, DNRs real quick, and then we'll probably split and go into part two, and we'll actually get into the protocols. So here's a DNR. We know it's supposed to be a full sheet. It should be the orange color. Okay. 
Um, obviously, I've blacked out some of the personal information for HIPAA reasons, okay? But you should have a patient signature, the date, um, some of their personal information. There's going to have some descriptive stuff in here as far as what they want or don't want. Um, and of course, there should be a signature from a licensed healthcare provider. So it should be a doctor. Um, and there's probably going to be a witness on there as well. So look at this form and make sure that we have everything filled out, everything signed. Okay. Now, one of the questions was brought up, what if it's signed by a nurse, not a doctor? As far as I understood, it was supposed to be signed by a doctor, but apparently um, I've been hearing that a lot of um, hospice patients, uh, those cases are where nurses are signing those DNRs. So if ever in doubt, what do you do? You get on the phone, you call your medical director, and we just confirm. You know, tell the doc, hey, this is what we've got. We've got this form. This is the signature. It looks like it was signed by a nurse or somebody other than a doctor. Um, is it valid? Do you want us to follow it? Okay, and then do whatever your doctor tells you. Now, as far as our power of attorneys, living wills go, okay, um, this is what the power of attorney is going to look like. Again, it's going to have that patient's name all over it, a whole bunch of initials, okay. Um, it's going to have some explanation as to what they want or don't want. You know, don't resuscitate me, don't innovate me. I don't want to be, uh, you know, stay alive if I'm required to be on machines. Okay, it's also going to talk about who their designated uh, person is going to be that's going to make all these decisions now. Okay, so just looking through, uh, you can see here like the first couple pages is where we should find this, either the first couple or like the last page from what I've been told. You can find the personal information here, who it's been signed by. Okay. And here's your witness, again, a bunch of information, um, whoever that legal provider is that's going to sign it. All right, let's go to another one. All right, power of attorney here, okay? Now, something that was brought up to me, which thank you to those that brought this to my attention. Um, there's two different types of power of attorneys. Um, and on that paper, they're going to look fairly similar from what I've been told. Um, I haven't seen really any of these. Um, so uh, this is new to me, but durable health care. We want to make sure that it's a durable health care, whereas there are other forms that say a financial durable general power of attorney. Okay, so don't just look for power of attorney. There's two different things, one for medical, one for financial. So be very clear that we have that health care one. Okay, and this is just kind of what those forms will look like here. Okay, so financial one doesn't really pertain to us, but here's your medical one. All their information, okay, should be signed. Now, that protocol that I was talking about, our special protocol for the Jane Doe protocol, right? So this is just a very young girl with a very rare seizure disorder um, that doesn't seem to be very receptive to our standard benzos, Versed, Valium, Ativan, okay? So just a quick recap for those of my, in my department, if we are responding to this child, mom is very in tune. She knows exactly what needs to be done. She's got a copy of this protocol. Um, I know there's at least a copy of this protocol in our drug box because she's in our first due. Um, it was pretty much agreed upon by all the medical directors, the family, PCH, the, the patient's doctors. So uh, what we're supposed to do when we get on scene is ketamine. If mom usually has given her all the meds that she can, uh, the seizure is not going to break, so she calls us, we show up, we deliver two milligrams per kilogram intramuscular of ketamine, okay? If that doesn't work, in about 10 minutes, we can redose that again. Uh, several crews have ran on her since this protocol. They've actually done this, one round, two rounds, um, and it seems to work pretty well. So um, don't be afraid to give ketamine, which is very very odd i never would have thought but apparently it works for her so and then i would as you give your patch if you're or your courtesy notification when you write in with this child to pch definitely inform them that this is so and so and we're following her, her specific protocol that's why we gave the ketamine that way they're fully aware and whoever's taking that call can uh, let the doctor know um all right, with that, I'm going to conclude as part one. And when I come back, we're going to start part two and actually dive into the PDF and all of these protocols. Thank you.